Welcome back or welcome to Grateful and Full of Greatness. I'm your host, Mark Lassini. On this podcast, I sit down with guests who, in my opinion, live their lives in, in the pursuit of greatness. This platform allows me to discuss and explain strategies that go into reaching peak performance. This is episode 49. My guest is Kayla Trainer, an upstate New York native. Kayla is the esteemed head coach for Syracuse University Women's Lacrosse. Prior to her two years as head coach, she started her coaching career at Harvard and then Boston College, where she assisted them in winning a national championship in 2021. As a student athlete, Kayla remains the only player in Syracuse Women's Lacrosse history to earn four first team All American honors in each of her four seasons. She was a three time finalist for the Torton and Honda Awards, and she was awarded Attacker of the Year in three consecutive seasons. On top of being ACC Offensive Player of the Year and selected to the NCAA All Tournament team in each of her four seasons in college, she set school records across the board. On the international stage for Team USA, she won gold medals at the 2017 and 2022 World Championships, and she was named to All World Team both times. She played professionally for over five years and is arguably the best to ever play women's lacrosse. Now, she looks to carve another path to greatness as a head coach. In getting to know Kayla, her competitive fire, desire to win, ability to motivate, curiosity to learn, and passion for what she does is not only evident, but contagious for those who are around her. I'm excited to have her here to share her story and philosophies. So without further ado, let's get started. Kayla, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Yeah, excited to be here. In getting ready for this episode, um, it was apparent to me that you didn't come from a powerhouse program uh, with every person in your family history being an all-time great lacrosse player. So I'd love to hear more about those early years and what it was like growing up in, in, in your town and, and who introduced you to the sport at what age? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think nowadays you would say I took to lacrosse later. I started playing in seventh grade, which seems really early, but the way travel ball is now and, you know, that seems like a, a late time to start. But um, early I played soccer and basketball. My dad's a basketball coach. Uh, has been my whole life. So uh, we are a really big basketball family. Um, and my first love was definitely soccer. I wanted to play college soccer. I loved the game. I loved playing. I thought that I could maybe play at a high level. Um, so I was a soccer basketball player. And then uh, my town, especially on the boys side, is really good in lacrosse. I actually had a babysitter that uh, was my neighbor and she played lacrosse and she gave uh, me and my sister uh, sticks. So we just started doing it. And I actually, when I started doing it, I can't say it was like, I loved it right away. I really didn't. I loved soccer and basketball still. And then, you know, as I went, when I got to my freshman year in high school, I had a coach who uh, my mom was a big believer in playing for your town and not playing for like club or elite teams, just because my dad believed in it because he didn't like when players played AAU. He liked when they played for our high school. So my mom was really against me trying out for different teams and things like that. So um, my high school coach convinced her and said, you know, you got to let her do it. And mm -hmm. uh, she said, I'll be willing to drive her. So she took me out to a all-star tryout uh, at the time it was called the school girls tournament. So I tried out for like all of New York state and that was really how I got introduced to lacrosse and learned to love it that, oh, wow, I could play at a high level and play with these girls and make the A team and things like that. So uh, very fortunate that I had a high school coach that uh, believed in me and gave me opportunity and, uh, and, and parents were finally letting me go and try out for some teams. So um, but yeah, I, I, my first love was definitely soccer and basketball. You know, it, it's interesting. And I, I guess I spoke out of tune when I said not a powerhouse program, Nesca, you know, being a, a more lacrosse, um, centered and focused, um, town. Um, so cool. I, I mean, I see a lot of similarities and, and I love the, the aspect of your parents really not pushing you into any one sport, but being there and pulling you something that I brought up multiple times on different episodes. Cause it just seems to keep coming up is there's this book called Developing Talent in Young People by Benjamin Bloom. And it talks about the importance of that early environment and not getting like, I'll just use this 
analogy about pulling the flower too soon, right? And really push it. And you see that a lot in today's day and age, but like uh, that natural growth to it. And uh, the inflection point of you trying out for the all-star team, I guess I, I, I didn't have this question prepared, but do you think if you just stayed in town and you didn't go to that all-star thing, do you think you would find a way to flourish? Or it was one of those things where it was so opportunistic that you had to do something like that in order to flourish in the sport? I mean, I'm, I'm confident that, you know, I say this all the time, if you're good, you're good. And you'll, you know, you'll find a way. I think people think you have to play everything in order to get recruited, which I don't agree with, but I certainly think it provided me an opportunity. Um, you know, the trial was out in Syracuse. And, um, for me, that was, uh, my only scholarship offer out of high school, uh, was recruited by other schools, but, um, I would say, playing for coach gate, Gary gate, he was definitely saw me early. And I think that had a lot to do with, uh, trying out for those teams out in Syracuse and the team that I tried out for, which I had no idea at the time, um, school girls used to be how they picked players to try out for the USU 19 under 19 team. And, um, out of that tryout, I was one of the five people selected for it. And I had awesome. no idea what they were talking about because <laughs> uh, I was never, I never played club. Like I didn't know. Um, so like I had a, just by doing that, I had such a crazy opportunity right away. Mm. Um, so I think I would have absolutely been able to, I think I knew lacrosse was going to be my path. I, I I'm sure I would have had great opportunities, but they might just, my path or my journey might've looked different than it does now. Awesome. And I mean, you brought up mom, you brought up dad. It was evident there's a lot of love and support there. And then you, you touched on Gary. That, that bleeds into my next question where I wanted you to specifically talk about some of your earliest role models, you know, coaches or, or, or mentors that and, and perhaps like each one's like one or two impact that they had on you, like what they represented in, in your growth. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm so fortunate that I've had amazing mentors in my life. Um and I know I've talked about it, but I really, for me, it all started at home. And I know I'm so fortunate because not everybody has that, but my father, in terms of uh, just being a coach and being kind and my, so my mom was, uh, she worked at a domestic violence shelter. My dad was a special ed teacher. They were extremely kind and giving people and taught me so much about life that I'm still learning what they've taught me. Um but, you know, they, they gave to everyone and, and they would do anything for somebody else and just truly are kind people. And I would say that for me, that mentorship really started at home and, you know, I'm not sure I've met kinder people in my life than them. So I'm super fortunate. And then, you know, along the way I had great, great coaches and great uh, people in my life, um, you know, great high school coaches in soccer and basketball and lacrosse, um, you know, and then certainly as I got to college, you know, probably my biggest mentor in life outside of my house has been coach gate. Um, and, uh, yeah, my, and my older sister too, just Alyssa, she's a college coach at union, uh, and she played soccer, basketball, and lacrosse. And, uh, has taught me a lot about humility, um, and a lot of different things, but I've been so fortunate, you know, and then even outside of college, and I don't know if you're trying to, if I'm going the wrong direction here, but, uh, thing? post-college, like how lucky am I? I got to learn from Lisa Miller and Acacia Walker Weinstein in my professional career, um, and assistant coaches through the way, Carla Farkas at Harvard and Jen Ken at BC. So I've, I've, you know, I've been so blessed that I've had amazing people in my life and so many lessons I've been able to learn. I'll tell you what, what comes to mind is, uh, you know, how much of that is, uh, you know, coincidence and luck versus choice. And, and I know for my young student athlete career, it was really, really important to me who I played for, right? Like, uh, it was my first episode on this entire podcast and the generation of it, but, but the guy who put a lacrosse stick in my hand and the influence he had on me. So, you know, I guess I would dovetail this into, you know, advice for a younger student athlete that's listening to this. Uh, would you be in lockstep and agree with me that choosing to play for a coach is one of the most important decisions that they can make uh, at the high school, college and, and, and level beyond? 
Yes. But the only thing I think to that is, and I really didn't know this until like after college, but my parents, my father was a coach. So no matter who my coach was, there was no ever allowed discussion of they don't know what they're talking about or whatever. Everything was a lesson. So you, there was no bad coach. No one talked. There was no bad teacher. There was, I made a mm. mistake and, and mm. I had to deal with the consequences. And, um, you know, so I, I'm a believer that no matter what you can be taught so many lessons, good, bad, and, you know, not to jump ship. If you don't think your coach is good enough, I think, trust the process and everything happens for a reason and don't bash on somebody that's giving a lot of their life for you. So mm. I, I do think though, when you're ultimately choosing your decision, if you're fortunate, fortunate enough to have that choice that, you know, I think that was the biggest part in my decision though, playing for, for coach gate at Syracuse was to play for that coach. Remarkable. I mean, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, the, the ownership and the personal responsibility side of it, you know, that really resonates with me, you know, Gary Gate, big name in the sport, obviously revolutionized it. Many people who think of the name Gary Gate would think of the plays that he made and his performance. Uh, perhaps you could tell us something different, right? You know, because what comes to mind for you is different than what comes to mind for the whole lacrosse world when it comes to Gary Gate. Maybe there's a story inside of it or something that he represents as to why you brought him up as to one your biggest mentor. Mm -hmm. He's hard. I don't even know where to begin just because of the influence that he's had on me. Um, he was my college coach. He, you know, we've stayed in touch, obviously, after I left college. His daughter is one of my best friends. So he's such a big part of my life. So it's hard to figure out where it really begins. But I think the most, I think two things really stick out to me. One would be that in college, he always told me the truth. He never told me that I was great. He never said, oh, you're awesome or anything like that. It was always, to be honest, it was always very critical. And mm. he wasn't like that with everybody. You know, he really understood the, the players. And But with me, he was really, really, I would say, truthful. And that was challenging. And, um, you know, even to this day, he doesn't say, Oh, you're great. Or anything. no, never. I mean, even I remember, I don't know if this is bad, but in my, my senior year after the tour ton, you know, he talked about some of the things that I still was never able to accomplish. Cause if maybe if I had done something a little bit more mm. than I would have, mm. and I appreciate that so much, um, mm. you know, because he told me the truth, he understood me and he knew that I was always on a quest to be better. And by doing that, I it pushed me to a level that if I played for anybody else, I don't know if I would have gotten where I am. Um, so I, I respect that so much about him that he's always told me the truth and always pushed me and challenged me to be the best. But at the same time, the second thing that I think of when I think of him and what he's given me is I think he's given me the greatest gift you could give somebody else, which is the gift of belief. And he made me believe in myself and he never did it by telling me that I was good or anything like that. But if we were in a crunch time in a game, if we, you know, I think back to my junior year, we were in the ACC tournament. Um, you know, we were in the championship game. We were in overtime against North Carolina down at UVA. And if we I forget if we won the draw or we hadn't won it yet, but he called a timeout and we're all standing there waiting for him to talk to us or draw play or whatever. And he said it in a joking manner, like just kind of laughing said, all right, ladies, the plan is get K train the ball. And that was it. That's all he said. And we just stood there for the rest of the 45 seconds. And it was just really funny. Cause all he, all he thought was just get, give me the ball and we have an opportunity to win. And, because of that, he didn't say how I need to do anything, anything like that. It was just get me the ball. <laughs> so we won the draw. We went down. And in my head, I was thinking, I got to get it right away before Carolina defense can set up. So as soon as we brought the ball down, caught it, I went to X, beat my defender. We scored. We won our first ACC championship. And Amazing. like he never once still to this day has been like, oh, you're such a great player or you're such a great coach. Nothing. But in a moment like that, 
he had so much faith and belief in me that to mm-hmm. win an ACC championship, the only thing mm-hmm. we had to do was get me the ball. And I think that is so much more powerful than ever telling somebody how good they are. So, I mean, he's given me, I think, like I said, one of the greatest gifts in life, which is, you know, giving somebody belief in themselves. It's so powerful. And I'm so lucky I played for him because he gave me that gift. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what to say about the belief. I, obviously, I just want to almost let that sink in for a second. Uh, really powerful. I sat down with a clinical psychologist. His name is Dr. Nick Molinaro. And he put me through something called the test of attention and interpersonal style. And I, after I was done, I was like, so what do you see? You know, what are the strengths? What are your weaknesses? And he started talking to me as a player and then as a coach. You know, this is one of your, one of your problems as a coach is you're too much of a cheerleader. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he was like, um, well, if someone does a rep, you say, oh, good job. And then they do another rep and you say, oh, good job. But there were different reps, mm-hmm. right? People are not going to know the truth. And when you brought up the first point about Gary, that he always gave you the truth, right? I think, um, especially as a young coach, myself, but other young coaches, is you really just want, you care about the heart and the soul of who you're coaching. That you don't want to hurt them or criticize them or give them a constructive thing. But the truth actually, even though it hurts momentarily, it really sets them free in the long term, right? And, get, and actually the pain comes, if you're too much of a cheerleader, if you will, for, your, for, for whoever you're talking about, the pain comes later on. Because they're not the same rep, right? It's totally different. And you could be learning. But I also think you have to be receptive to that, right, Kayla? The fact that you were coachable is a, is a really a unique thing that you had. Um, and I, I, I agree with you. And you know I agree with you about the belief system side of things. Like, there, there's nothing more powerful than that. What I want to go now is, like, you, you were coachable. You were open to criticism. And kind of putting your earliest chapters in a bow, if you will. What was it about you as a younger student athlete, right? You talked about your influence at home. You talked about these early uh, coaches for you. But what was it for you as a younger student athlete, looking back when you reflect as to what separated you? Obviously, the talent was there. The athletic ability was there. But could you think of like one, two or three intangibles that, that, that really separated you? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me was that I was really competitive in everything. I still am. And I think, you know, even a lot of coaches, we say when you go recruiting, there's so many talented players that we're watching. It's unbelievable the talent that we watch. But the players at the next level that can really get it done are the ones that just are so competitive. Mm -hmm. A a player with a lot of talent that has hesitation is hard to coach. Um, A player with that's really competitive with less talent is easy, easy, easy to coach. So I think for me, um, you know, my dad refers to this, uh, uh, we youth soccer, my first introduction to sports, I was kind of out there. I don't know, just probably following the ball or something. I don't I have no memory of it, but my dad pulled me over and he said, Kayla, it's okay to be aggressive. And he said, I knew exactly what that meant. It just clicked in my mind. And ever since that moment, I've been so aggressive and super competitive. And I think for a female at such a young age, that's really important that that's okay. You know, and that, that my parents said, that's okay. And you can go for it. And ever since then, I've been unwavering in my competitive fire and competitive spirit. And I think as an athlete, you know, I, I definitely have gifts in terms of talent and athleticism, but I'm not overly athletic by any means. Um, you know, I think it really is my competitiveness that separated me as an athlete and allowed me to play at that next level, whether it be in college or on the international stage is just how competitive I am. And and I see that with my U.S. teammates, too. You know, if you're at that level, you know, we play anything and it's it gets a little awkward because it's too competitive. You know, it, it could yeah. be cards, it could be whatever. So I think that's the piece that you have to have to make it at the next level. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more with you. The click that happened to you where it's okay to be aggressive. uh, I think that's an important thing um, for many people, young athletes to have. What comes to mind for me is uh, a coach. I can't even remember who said it to me. They said, Glissini, if you play at 99%, you're an average player. 
And I really was like, whoa, whoa, yeah. like, okay. So I can't ever step on a field ever again without that happening. And the, the, the thing that was said in my episode six with Ben Ives is he said, as a younger student athlete, you're either a nuclear power plant or a nuclear explosion. So you don't want to be too aggressive to the point where you're all uncontrolled passion, but you really do want to have that focused attention uh, on what you're doing. And the last point I would make is a psychology point, which is in every single game, it's made up of two things, compet- competition and cooperation. Mm-hmm. And the best, best best athletes know how to do both, right? So what did Kayla have really early on? The ability to cooperate, you know, following the ball, everybody's having fun. That's great. But now it's time to go for it, right? And, and um, in the great athletes, you, you want to put reins on a wild horse rather than be kicking donkeys. Like, let's go, let's go. Like, uh, like you want to be able to pull that back. And I think when you bring up the Team USA, like side of things, it's like, everybody's there from a competition level. And now what's important is the cooperation. You're, this is your role in the team. This is your role in the team. And then you, you blend that in. Um, in the introduction, Kayla, I brought up all these highlights. So they're obviously evident and, and we can go into them over the course of, of our talk here. But I really care about, and if it's okay with you, I'm talking about the hardships, either one or two that really stand out. Um, inflection points in your lacrosse career as an athlete that really were monumental for you, right? Because it's really hard uh, to, to, to see, oh, I, you don't learn anything when, when you're happy. That's a way of saying it. You don't learn anything when you're happy. So are there, are there one or two hardships that you would point to that were really inflection for you? Certainly. And I would just say too, to start that, and I, and I don't mean this in a, in a way of, um, you know, talking about myself it really in a positive manner, but I, I think it's important to say too, that you know, in terms of lacrosse, like I really haven't had a lot of struggle, you know, like there's, I've never been cut from a team, you know, mm. and I, that, I think that's important to say, like, I don't want to s- sit here and say, oh, I've had such a hard time. No, I've been really fortunate and I've been really lucky. And there's a lot of things that I don't understand that people have gone through that are really difficult. But, you know, I think for me, the critical points that were really difficult were for me not to keep going back to high school, but going back to high school. Um, I played soccer, basketball, lacrosse, and so did my older sister. And I was able to have a lot of success at an early age. I made varsity in all the sports as a ninth grader, but my older sister was on JV for every sport. And that was really difficult at home. And I didn't really understand how difficult it was for her really until we got older. And, you know, even now I understand it even more. It was really, really hard for her. Um, you know, her junior year, she was on uh, JV soccer. So I had already been on the team, you know, for multiple years and that was hard for her. And that was, that was hard from a social standpoint. That was hard, you know, from of course, an athletic standpoint, And I didn't really get it. And I wish I did more back then. It's, it's probably a regret of mine I have, Hmm. but, um, you know, it taught me a lot about humility and understanding other people and, and, um, you know, just that I understand how fortunate I was and how lucky I was, you know, and, and it, it just, you know, I have a lot of love for my older sister and I, I know it wasn't easy, but she was just awesome. And she had such a great attitude and, and there were so many things that she was so good at and she played college lacrosse. She was an amazing college lacrosse player. Um, but it definitely gave me an understanding of other people. And, you know, I couldn't think too highly of myself or talk about myself because at home you, I couldn't, you know, I really couldn't because that was hard for my sister. And, um, you know, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize how hard it was for her until I, you know, be, was 26, 27 years old. I, I really didn't get it. And I really get it now, you know, especially as a coach um, that y- you are so important and it does sports are hard. They're really hard. And for a lot of reasons, from a social reason, from, you know, sports just in our home, that was hard, you know? So mm-hmm. I think that was really challenging. It still is, you know, I still learn more about it, you know, as I go and um, just identity and things like that. Um, so that was one thing. I think the other thing too, just playing multiple sports, it teaches you so much humility, but I think the other part for me, like in my journey was actually more recently 
um, I'd say two years ago, um, trying out for the 2022 world championship team. Uh, you know, if COVID didn't happen, I don't think I would have made the U S team. I was deaf. They did a ranking system and I was ranked really low, not towards the top. I wouldn't have been one of the four attackers that made it. Um, and like I said, I, up until that point, I was 28 years old and I had never been cut from a team. So at 28, I'm starting to experience, oh, wow. Like, you know, just all these feelings and emotions that I haven't felt. And, you know, it's kind of sad to talk about, but I felt all of them, you know, and, and it was hard. And I, you know, just second guessing myself, like, you know, to be honest, I had questioned, like, should I be doing this lacrosse thing? Like, am I really not good? And so I just had a lot of doubt. I think the biggest thing I did was for the first time in my life, started to blame other people. Hmm. And, you know, it was a critical moment for me because I had to do a lot of self-reflection. I had to talk about it with other people. And I did work with a sports psychologist. And once again, this person told me the truth and it was so important. And he told me that it was a really selfish mindset that I was in. And Mm. I was just so thankful. And I really am grateful that somebody told me the truth and told me that because it was, it was incredibly selfish. It was no one else's fault. I wasn't playing well. I wasn't playing well at all. I should have been ranked there. And I had so many excuses when I was playing in my mind that it didn't allow me to play well. I, I was not playing my best because it wasn't my fault and it was so selfish. And I'm just so grateful for that because I reframed my outlook and went in there and went back to a U.S. training camp with a ton of gratitude and changed the way I played instantly. And I played great. I played, started to play my best lacrosse again. And it was really coming from a place of gratitude was my outlook. And because of that, you know, I was able to make that team and had a great world cup and got to be all world where, you know, right before that, I, you know, I'm pretty confident. I mean, I know I was going to get cut because I wasn't ranked in the, in the, uh, in the top five, six, you know, I was right below that. So, um, again, really grateful. Someone told me the truth, but those were critical moments, I think for me in my career and definitely two of the harder moments with lacrosse. Right. I mean, I could have, I don't know how many thousand people on on this uh, podcast and and they wouldn't have the vulnerability you just had. So I really appreciate that. I think, uh, that's going to be one of the most powerful parts of, the, of our whole conversation, what you just shared, the second guessing, the questioning, the blaming other people. I mean, who cannot relate to that? I I, mean, I don't know a single person that can't. Um, and the ones that really resonate with me are, you know, from the first point, humility. You know, what I do not know is more important than what I do know. And you had a lot to learn and that you learned that at 28 and you're still learning. Um, and then the gratitude. Gratitude is the healthiest human emotion, right? When you're thankful, you can't be frustrated. When you're when you're grateful, you can't be angry. All these things to get replaced by thankfulness and, and gratitude. And it's very hard for people to understand that because you don't see the brain flexing like a muscle, right? Or it's like not like conditioning or running a mile faster, but the more you can express. And I guess the quote there is change your expectation to appreciation and your whole life will change. And that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, I, I just want to stay on the reframed outlook sort of things, right? Because as you evolve as a person or as an athlete or as a coach, right? Something that comes to mind is like core values and first principles. And now you've shared, Kayla, like these really popped words throughout our, ta- our short conversation so far, such as kindness, right? Such as truth, such as belief, such as gratitude, humility. When you look at your program now, right? Syracuse Women's Lacrosse, right? What, what are some things that you're looking to have in your athletes? Right. That 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 you're looking to bring in there that right, you want to revolve your your circle, your huddle around that you want them to have. Yeah, in terms of like core values or things like that, non-negotiables. I think for me, uh, my top three, like without question, are um hard work, number one, passion, number two, and three, gratitude. Uh, those three things, you know, I think are so important. Uh, they've certainly have been a big part of like my identity and who I want to be. Um, and I think they're really powerful things. Gratitude, obviously, I had just talked about 
but I think it's so important that you appreciate people around you and have gratitude for where you are. I think it's a pretty lonely, miserable life if you don't have that. Um, and there's so many people, I mean, we talk about Syracuse lacrosse. I mean, it's amazing how many people invest their life into the program and into these student athletes that really go unnoticed, you know, and, and, you know, our equipment manager, Kyle Federley, and he's worked there for 48 years. He gets them anything they want. I mean, he does anything for them. The, our athletic trainer, she is never around her family at home because she's always with our student athletes. You know, mm -hmm. people don't realize they're there before practice, during practice, after practice, late hours, weekends. I mean, and that's just the start. There's so many people like that, that devote their life to it. So if you can't have a gratitude for those people, um, you know, it, it's, that's going to be a, that's going to be a long, hard life, I think, sure. uh, because we are so fortunate, but hard work, I think it's so important. It's, you know, just should be a staple, I think in, in any program, any mission that you're on in life, trying to accomplish something. Um, I think, you know, for us, we, at Syracuse, we're trying to win a national championship and trying to reach that elite level. And it's so hard to do. It's so difficult. So, you know, you have to work hard. That's just the standard, I think, across the board. And everybody else is. So you, you have to. And then the third for me, passion. You know, I just have so much passion. I'm very lucky that, you know, I think people search their whole life to find a passion, a love for something. And and I've had mine. I've no mine. It's lacrosse and and coaching and, um, you know, just the relationships that you get to make within our sport. Uh, so I think, you know, for me, like passion, like I want our Syracuse lac lacrosse to play with a ton of passion and love for the game. And I think if you watch us play, you'll see that, but, um, you know, I, I want our players to have passion and love it, you know? And I think I learned that also from Gary is that if you look at, you know, coaching across the board in, in, in our country, there's so many Syracuse lacrosse players that are now coaching. Um, mm. and I think that's because you fall in love with the game at Syracuse. You, you have such a passion for lacrosse and, and, you know, you want to, you want to share that gift that you've, that you've been able to have. So I would say those three are the most important for me. Amazing. And when I, my first question to you was more about, you know, when did you, when did you pick up the stick and all of that? And you talked about seventh grade and, and, and getting into it. I want to ask you a shorter question about the coaching side of things. Did you always know that you wanted to be a lacrosse coach or when did that start? Yeah, I did. I, uh, when I got to high school, I just knew I wanted to coach because my dad was a coach, you know, from my, growing up my really young age, my birthday present, my big birthday present would be, I got to go watch my dad's practice and I got to put my hand in the huddle at the, when they broke it down. So like, I knew I wanted to coach forever. And actually a big part of my college decision was going to a place where I thought they could help me become a coach. Wow. So Gary knew that. So like he would talk to me about, you know, helping me get ready to be a coach one day. So I, I've known I wanted to coach since I was really young, for sure. Okay. Going on hard work, passion and gratitude. What has been able to translate from your player to coach and what really didn't um, easily go from player to coach? What has to be different? What are you noticing um, as a player that you can bring to you as a coach? such as hard work, you're working just as hard, probably, if not harder as a coach in different areas. Um, but what's different and what's, what's the same about being a player versus a coach? That's a good question. I've never been asked that question before. Um, you know, I think like in terms of those things that I talked about, um, you know, like you said, hard work, I think that's, that's easy. That's, you know, that's just what you do. Um, and like you said, I think you work even harder as a coach. I, it's hard for me to nail down certain things. I think I have a long way to go in coaching to have a precise answer for you. Um, there's so many challenges I think I have in coaching. One that we talked about earlier when you were talking about that, getting a player to believe in themselves, but not being a cheerleader, but also mm. balancing the truth. Like that is so hard to do in coaching. Like that is one of the hardest things in coaching I found because right away as a really young coach, and I still am a really young coach, but my first year in coaching, 
I just thought the truth, like what coach gate did for me was so powerful. So I thought that was the best way to coach. So I tried to do that. And that blew up in my face (laughs) because I had to realize that not everybody can handle that. That doesn't work for everybody. And then even now I find myself a bit more balancing. Like, am I being too much of a cheerleader? Like, am I, am I, I just want you to believe in yourself so badly that I'm telling you this, like I Mm. believe in you, but Mm. that doesn't really work. So I fight that balance every day, every year, every athlete, like it's so challenging to do. And I think the greatest coaches in sports across the board have that Mm -hmm. and they can get their players to compete at a really high level because of that. Um, You know, so that's something that I, I struggle with and I, I fight, you know, I want, I want every player to believe in themselves in some way, but how you do it with every athlete is so different. You know, so, I mean, I, I just think of it cause you talked about that earlier, but you know, that is certainly one of my challenges in coaching is, and I think that's the challenge for coaches pulling the most out of every student athlete, pulling everything they have. So my job, I believe is for every athlete to max out in their potential. So when they graduate Syracuse, they said that was the best I ever could have been. And I take that so personally, but that is the challenge in coaching. And I'm, I, I don't really have a precise answer because I am learning so much every year and growing and trying to evolve so that I can master that for all of my players, that they feel like I left Syracuse the best I could have been. Um, because I think that's, that's our job right there. Amazing. You, you're pulling a story out of me in, in one of my like immersive pra- uh, practical hands-on graduate courses. I had the f- fortune of learning from a guy named will stillwell will stillwell was a 17 year colleague of a guy named carl rogers and carl rogers is the best humanistic psychologist of all time he just was able to be so deep with a person and and have these instrumental changes and what did i learn from will stillwell well really early on he said in the course you have to figure out what works for you right you have to figure out what works for you and really what he meant by that is when you're working with a client or a player or, or whatever it is, you can ask questions and have them answer, right? You know, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? And, and they give you the truth about their life, about what they're seeing, all that. Or you could be more like the truth giver, right? Where you're coaching them. Just do this. Just do this. Just do this. And I'm not too sure what's the right method. I know that me as a fifth grader, I needed more of just do this. Stay on this track. Do this. You know, Coach Callen and say, Mark, be the one. Focus on this. Do this, right? These sort of things will get you to the next level. And then as I evolved, if you go into a huddle with Coach Janowski, for example, he said, what are you guys seeing out there? Yeah. Right? It's not, it, that's, like, that's how the huddle looks. And then finding that juxtaposition, like you talked about, that balance of what's the right amount of questions versus telling them what to do is a very hard thing. And then what I learned most at the end of that course that really just resonated into my soul is he left me with this short little comment about my final paper. He said, Mark, great work this semester. Um, I want you to think about more experiences of your own that you trust. And why did that hit me, Kayla? Because, and you, you know, me now for, for a better part of a year, I I, I know this book. I've seen this. I've I've read that I've done that. And and I could able to connect, connect these points, but what about what I experienced and how do I bring that to the table? And I think when you're coaching, these athletes, the way in which to find your your true north uh, on that answer is like you talked about hard work, passion, and gratitude. Kayla has those, mm-hmm. right? So you're almost living your identity inside the program, and then you, you're able to navigate how to approach a certain athlete. And then I'll always bring it back to this, like you brought up. It's the receptivity of that athlete, right? You're, they're going to be different um, in different times. Can I add to that? Please. The other biggest thing that I think you have to learn in coaching that even like with all your experience and all these things and who who you are is at the end of the day, it's really not about you. It's about them. And that's, and that's it. You know, even in terms of like the way, not even just a player, like that relationship piece, but like systems, how you run, like, like I run, I've been able, been very fortunate. I've run offense at everywhere I've coached and the way I coach our offense at every place has to be so different because the kind of student that's at that school, like the way I coach the Harvard kids 
was so different than the way I coached the BC kids, which is so different than the way I coached the Syracuse kids. And not just in terms of communication, but like literally X's and O's because they learn differently. They think differently. They believe different things. They may have had different coaches that have already had certain things. So the way you have to coach is so different, not just in terms of relationships, but X's and O's too, because ultimately at the end of the day, you know, you have to be authentic. You have to be yourself, but it really isn't about you. And that's why I think coaching is such a, a selfless job. 100%. And it's been really hard for me to talk about my own experience because I feel like anytime I talk about my own experience, that's lacking humility. And then you better yeah. stop and get off this track. Yeah. And it's very hard. Something that's like uh, staying in the back of my mind, and you said it really early on, but I want to pull it out right now, is you said something that Gary said to you years later about how like you could have even been better right? Or, or what you could have done. I want to go back to that right now, because you talked about, you know, the systems and what has to be different. And you don't want to bring up your own ideology into it. What is the answer to that question? You know, what is the answer to where could you have been better as, as a player? I mean, you see the accolades, it's all there. What, what do you think it is? And when you ruminate and reflect on that and meditate on that, how could you have been better by, as a player? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I would say, I mean, there's a lot of things that come to mind um, in terms of where I could have been better. I mean, even though I pride myself on hard work, I do think I could have worked harder. Just in terms of, I think where Gary really believed in me was that he knew I was very creative and coachable. So like whatever he would tell me to do, I would do it. If he said, I want you to jump headfirst off this bridge, I would do it. (laughs) Without question, no doubt, like I'm doing it. But I think like where he saw me, where I could have gone further is really like taking the game to another level in terms of creativity. Like Mm. I see people do things now, but they didn't really do that when I was playing. There was a different style of lacrosse when I was playing as opposed to right now. And I definitely for my time, I would say played more outside of the box I wasn't like when I played, it was like all about the midfielder and it was just run by somebody and finish. Don't you can't shoot sidearm. You can't, you know, so it's very like traditional lacrosse. And I didn't really play like that, but I think, you know, and this is where I'm kind of bummed with where I think I could have gone is I think I could have really pushed the limit and I could have really been more creative and played just tried more things. Um, you know, I would try things in practice and Gary would always show me certain things. And then I would try it in practice, but there was this like little hesitation in a game to really just go for it. I mean, I remember my last game in my college career working on a dive shot that no real women's player has done. And I used to practice it all the time. I had a mat out in Manly field house and I would just do it every night. I would just practice it, practice it, practice it. And then I never went for it in the game, you know? And, and I think like that's that area where like, if, if I had just given more, like practice more and, and had more confidence to go for it in a game, I think I really could have helped our sport more. Um, But I did have this, like, I don't know, this little something that held me back in terms of taking not just my game, but like the game of lacrosse to the next level. So I do have some regrets, like, you know, watching how I played and then, you know, just in terms of I could have just worked more so that I had more confidence in a game to go for some of these things. And I definitely had the coach that that was helping me get there. So, you know, in terms of that, I think I could have went for it more as a player. But even now, like playing in the last World Cup, like I still I can like I I don't think that was my best. Like I could have played I could have played better. So I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what that could have looked like but there's definitely I think like more as a player more on the table that I could have reached but but I'm okay with that because I I love coaching I love where I'm at but I do think there there was more I agree with him a hundred percent you know there's this uh, apocryphal story that I was taught by Dr. Rob Gilbert where there's this group of penguins in a classroom and someone's in front of them and says, okay, today we're going to learn how to fly. So I want you to stack the desks on top of each other. We're going to start with two desks and we're going to jump off them and we're going to, we're going to learn how to fly. And I'll make a long story short. There's one 
penguin named Philip, who literally is falling from every tier and trying to fly up his wings, but he's not able to fly. And then like by the end of class, it's right before the bell rings and there's like seven desktop on top of each other and Philip jumps off and he learns and he's flying and he's flying around the room and everybody's clapping, going nuts. And then the bell rings and Philip walks home. Yeah. And, and, and that really reminds me of what you're saying. I was working on this. I was working yeah. on this and I, I never did it. And it's a really about how do we bridge that gap from, I could think about this, I could practice this and then actually going forward. And, and there's many conversations we can have about whether there's the mental skills or, or things that go into the implementation of it, but how true is that, right? That going for it nature and taking it to the next level. I promise you, this is going to be my last question about like the, what do you know now that you wish you knew then sort of questions that I've been asking you. But I really do think that there's something there that maybe you haven't said is if I was to ask you, what's the same versus what's different about Kayla in like college and, and, and in high school compared to now, right? Because you talked about that revolutionary time at 28 years old and, and, and things you learned along the way. Is there something that's different now than you used to be? And, and what's the same? Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess like one thing that I would say is different, and this has been like just through my coaching experience, but I used to be like as a player, I, I'm very like creative and try things. And um, like I said, play outside the box a little bit. And I I try, I, I want to be creative. I want to not flashy, but a bit. Yeah, I want I want you to be excited to watch me play. Mm. Um. And I want to play with style. Like that's important to me, but it's interesting because as a coach, I, I want to pull that out as my players on the field, but I, you know, like I played for a coach that was definitely very laxed in terms of like the mm. way he coached is very different than like an Andy Shea, like you played for, which is like discipline and the little things matter and blah, blah, blah. And it's interesting because I didn't play for a coach like that. And I loved that. And it, I think that allowed me to be creative, but as a coach, I'm a bit more like that. I, mm. I, I am, I'm, I believe in discipline. I think that discipline wins and I think the little things matter. And, you know, even like the players that have played for Gary and then have played for me, you know, I heard one of them say, I think it was Emma Ward say, yeah, you, you could definitely could get away with things with Gary that you can't get away with Kayla, which is just so funny because I don't, I, my play would not reflect that in coaching, but mm. I think that was from my experience uh, at Boston college and how much I learned from Acacia and Jen, um, you know, and just the way they ran the program and, and, you know, just the discipline in that aspect, it's, it's pretty powerful. So, you know, I think as a coach, I definitely coach different than how visually I play on the field. Amazing. Uh, you know, uh, talking about you as a coach now and and knowing that what you have in front of you and your horizon and how great you're going to be as a coach many many wins are ahead of you you talked about well, one of the things that you take very personally is pulling the most potential out of every player that you coach uh something that i had prepared and i want to ask you now uh for our our time together was you know projecting you know decades down the road say you're coaching for that long um if you could be remembered for one or two things, what would you want to be remembered as, as a coach? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's hard. I, I had a really amazing conversation with, uh, with coach Bayheim the other day, uh, our basketball coach at Syracuse for literally ever. He, he's retired coaching and now his office is down the hall for me. And the other day I sat in his office and we talked for a couple hours and you know, wow. it's amazing. Yeah. I'm so lucky because he's one of the greatest college basketball amazing. coaches of all time. Amazing. But he said something to me that just stuck with me. And I don't know if I'm answering the question at all, but he said something that stuck with me and I can't stop thinking about it because I don't know if you know, coach Beheimer, how he's perceived, especially by the media and the public is that he's this, you know, this old guy that doesn't care and, and is just says whatever and is tough on the players and says whatever. But he told me the other day in the office that he's really thin skinned. And that, that was his exact words. He said, I'm very thin skinned. And his biggest suggestion to me was stay off of the media. Do not look at it. 
stay off of social media, get off of that. And he's had to do that because he says he's so thin skinned. He really cares what other people think about him. Hmm. And if you know Coach Beheim or you know of him, that is a wild statement because he does not reflect that at all. The way he talks to me, he's like, you know, and, and the way he talks to his players, it's F this, F that. And, and he's, you know, tough, tough as nails. And it seems like he wouldn't care. And I told him that I said, really, you come off like you wouldn't care what somebody says about you. He said, no, I'm, I'm very thin skinned. So I have to stay off of that stuff. Mm. But in a way it resonated with me. And because I am a people person and I do care what people think about me and I'd be lying if I said I didn't, but um, you know, and maybe this is my youth in coaching, but I, you know, I do want my players to all have really good relationships and I want them to enjoy playing with their teammates and enjoy playing for their coaches. Cause I think that's a great experience, you know, because we all want to win, but only one team wins. It's so hard to win. It's so hard to win. And I know that leaving college the you know, the greatest thing from college is my best friends. And so I want my players to leave and have great relationships with their teammates and coaches. And, you know, we use this word a lot and I want it to be genuine is family. I want it to feel like a family. And I do care a lot about that. And, um, you know, this philosophy of mine might change, you know, because this could be my youth speaking, but right now I think that's really important. And I hope that someday, um, you know, all the players that have played for me remember their experience as a really positive one and that they had great relationships with their players and their coaches, regardless of how we did that season. I want them to have a really good experience, whether we win or lose. And that's hard to do because I think especially at our level uh, in a, in a place where that championship weekend is expected, that's hard to do because you value yourself on your success a lot. And you know, what I'm learning now, but what I do feel passionate about is that I want my players to really have loved their experience. And I think you love your experience if you have good relationships with the people around you. So I would say that's something that I hope that in the future that I'm remembered for. Yeah. Excellent answer. And I'll, I'll say something that I've come to know is when I was a young pro, it was all about winning. Nothing else mattered. But yeah. now it is about that relationships, even through the losses, right? It's like, it, it it might sound cliche, but it's really not to say that, you know, you can win when you lose. Right. Mm-hmm. And what that means is like, you really went for it. Um, and, and you, you give your, your best shot. And, and I, I thought I want to thank you with, for sharing that story about Jim, because the thin skin I never even knew could be a, a compliment or a, a good thing, but that's actually an in- in- interesting way of looking at it. It's a really brand new perspective. Um, a few more questions. The, the, the one that I really wanted to ask was, about advice you'd give to a young coach, advice you'd give to a young player. And I think it could be answered by me asking you this question. Um, who, and I know you're going to say maybe a lot, but um, is one of the greatest teammates you've ever played for, with? And and what did they have that made him such a great teammate? And I think when you answer that, right, people can figure out how to be a great coach or a great parent or leader or, or, or a younger player. Mm-hmm. That is such a hard question because I have played with some of the best people in the world. I mean, I, that's such a hard question because, and I've been on so many different teams outside of just Syracuse in the pro league and on the U S team, but I'd have to say one person that I don't know if anybody listening would really know, but I refer to her as probably the best teammate I've ever had. And I think if you ever played on a team with her, you'd say the same thing. Um, a girl named Bridget Daly played at Syracuse. She's actually from my area. She's from the Albany area in upstate New York. Went to Bethlehem High School, played at Syracuse for four years. And um, again, I, I guess like I'm using the word truth, but I just think it's so impactful. But so she was a senior when I was a freshman. We were playing in our first um, fall ball weekend. It was at Syracuse. And we were playing, I think, the University of Albany or, or Binghamton or something like that. And it was pouring rain and we were standing outside in the rain waiting to play. And I remember kind of just like under my breath saying, like, can we stand inside and wait or something like that? Just under my breath, not to anybody. And she heard it and she called me out in front of the whole team and was like, how dare you have that attitude? And, 
you know, you've got to be grateful. It's a privilege to be here and privilege to wear this Jersey. And it was like, you know, it's fall of my freshman year. And it was one of the coolest things that ever happened to me. I mean, it was just amazing. Like a coach could say that to you and it might be important, but for a teammate to say that, that changes your trajectory as an athlete. And I am so grateful for her for that experience. And that's just one, but she really taught all of us how to be such a good person and to care so much about your teammates, but really like care about the school and the program and the community and what we're trying to do at the same time, you know? And I think, you know, you hear about like a lot of athletes that are complaining to their teammates and their teammates are just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, privately somewhere else, they're like, she has a bad attitude. No, Bridget told you to your face. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there was no like hidden secret. It was just, she told you to your face and she was just honest. And, but at the same way, so caring, you know, I remember I had a teammate who, one of her friends it was my best friend from college and her friend from growing up had died. And, and we were in, we were freshman year of college. We were really young and we were playing university of Florida. Um, uh, I think like the next day and we were at practice and I remember Bridget came up to me and said, uh, she gave me a hug and she was like, you know, sometimes you might need a hug too. Cause I was just watching my best friend in a lot of pain and that hurt, you know, and to think about me, like, in that moment was just so wild. And I think about that all the time in life now, especially with my, my, my players that if they going through a lot of trauma or a hard experience, the people around them are really affected by it too. So I always check in with those people too. And I don't know, these are just the two things that have come up in my mind. There's a million things of why Bridget is so impactful. I think not just to me, but to Syracuse lacrosse, that greatest teammate I ever played with. I think any of us who played with her would say the same thing and um, just very lucky that I got to play with her. I mean, when you say that sometimes you may need a hug too, I saw this Ted talk with a brilliant stat that said children on average smile over 400 times a day. Adults on average smile just over 20 times a day. It's like, what happens? What happens along the way? Right. Right. They, they, they stop playing they stop joking. And, um, relationships come to an end when there's no more laughter when there's no more play. It's all muscle tension, right? If you ever thought about a relationship that fell apart for the last several weeks to months, there was no laughing with that person. It was very, very serious. Every single thing was serious. So finding a way to play and joke and laugh and hug and, and those sort of things, uh, playfulness is inside of peak performance. And that's really a hard thing to, to remember because you want to work so hard. You want to have it. You want to achieve greatness. But at the same time, how do you keep that playfulness? And one of the things that I'm taking away from what you just said there, because this truth just keeps coming up, right? The truth, the truth, the truth is early on, we were talking about competition and cooperation and kindness, and honesty, and, 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 and what, how, how do you balance that? Right. How do you, how do you go about it? And I think truth bridges that gap. When, when to be caring and when to be competitive, right? Because there's a time for it, right? right? We, we, can, we can really be remorseful and, 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 and huggy and lovey-dovey at a certain point, but then there's times where we need to have some competitive fire and fight through some hard times and, and finding a way through that. My last question to you, Kayla, which is I ask everybody, is defining greatness. And, and you, you've been around great. You are great. There are, are greats that you've admired and things like this. So how do you know when you see it? What comes to mind? Um, if somebody's listening to this and they want to be great, how would you define it? Mm. I don't know. I'm going to have a bad answer because I got to really think about that. But I think, I think everybody is, has greatness within them. I think you just have to be your authentic self. I think that's the most important thing being you and um like being your authentic self, you're going to find what you're really good at and what you love and what you're passionate about. And, you know, some people that might be art, some people that might be music, some people that might be athletics, some people that might be being an educator or whatever it may be. But it's, it's really hard to find your greatness if you aren't your authentic self and you're not really you. And that's a really hard thing to do. Um, And, you know, I've been lucky that I've been able to do it because I've I grew up in a very loving environment and had a lot of support, um, you know, and I know everyone doesn't have that luxury. So it is really challenging, but 
you know, I think as you go in life, if you can be yourself, you can really find what you're great at and what you're meant to do and what you're meant to be here for. So I would say pursuing yourself and, and, and your, you know, identity and your authenticity is the most important thing in order to be great at what you are great at. I don't think that's a bad answer at all. And, and, and a quote comes to mind um, in an E.E. E. Cummings quote, to be nobody but yourself in the world that's doing its best day and night to make you like everyone else is means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and to never stop fighting. And I love that quote because it has a lot to do with what you just said, right? There's so much external noise that it's very hard to listen to the internal signal most of the time. Kayla, I, I don't know how else to wrap up by saying thank you very much for your time. Um, I, I learned so much in, in today's episode, and um, I look forward to the future uh, of, of our, our relationship and, and you as a coach and, and watching your greatness, not just as a player, um, but from the sidelines as well. Thank you. This is a blast.